I have to sometimes give up on trying to calculate every move. All right, guys, what's up? This is Justin Khan. You're listening to The Quest. And today, uh, my guest is Aaron Bali, who's the co-founder of Carbon Health, uh, which is a vertically integrated tech-enabled healthcare provider. He started in 2015, I think. Uh, which has today raised over $500 million and most recently valued at $3.3 billion. It's a lot. And uh, previously, Aaron was the co-founder and chairman of Udemy, uh, which is an online learning platform with over 50 million students learning from over 50,000 instructors and over 150,000 courses in 65 different languages, uh, which just IPO'd last month, right? Congratulations. Yes, exactly. It's been just... Uh... I can't believe this day this day happened. That's amazing. You've had a like incredible run. Uh, I feel like anybody can start a unicorn company if they work hard enough. But like once you start two, that's when you know it's like not luck. Yeah, it's uh, it's faded. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I still feel like I, I got lucky twice. <laughs> so, but uh, but there's definitely I think there's definitely learnings from like the first time that you can really incorporate in the second company. I think that's, that's, the thing that's fun about sec your second company is that it's typically more authentic uh, because you don't you know like what you are doing and you're more of like more opinions about how you want to do things. So uh, it's been a fun fun journey. Oh man, I want to dive into that. I'll, I'll put a yeah. flag to to dive into that later. But uh, let's like start with just how you got there. Like how did you how did you start? Like, where did you where did you grow up? Because you had like a pretty, you know, mm -hmm. uh, non traditional background for a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, right? Yes, no, I I definitely did. So I grew up in a in southeast part of Turkey in a, a kind of city called Malatya. I, I was born in a small village, um, and it was right out after the nineteen eighty coup nineteen eighty coup in Turkey military coup. So that area was very, under a lot of very strict like sanctions and. That is definitely not the probably not the kind of easiest place to grow up. Um, so, and my parents are teachers, and they're very idealistic. So, uh, they moved back to our village because there were pra there, there were literally no teachers in that whole surrounding area. Because all the teachers which were sent to work there, and same to the doctors, they would actually quit their jobs to avoid working in that area in that time time frame. So, uh, she was the only teacher rotating between five different grades. So all the kids from different wow. villages would come to our village. So my mom would just go teach first graders, second graders, third graders, and rotate between back to first graders. And she would maintain the school and she would try to convince more people to send their kids to school. So it was a very, it was a job which is like far beyond just like what you would consider like being a teacher job. But, um, I grew up there, but I think one of the things I'm always inspired from is in that area where the opportunities are so limited, there are all those people, just not just me, like I think sometimes overly indexed on what I did from there to here, but a lot of people went ahead and became very successful in their lives. Like, I mean, my sisters became in dark positions and civil engineers, a lot of other people actually went to school and did really well, despite the real kind of limited resources, because I think despite like a lot of economic challenges were there, but there was a lot of focus, emphasis, and just improving your life through like learning and education. So I had this like long-term thinking that like a lot of people are missing the opportunities, but they have the drive within themselves. If they like, and those people like when they see and see even the even in the the school where the teacher is only talking to you twenty percent of the time. So like imagine that type of school. Even yeah. despite that being the reality, all those kids would world like would really walk 10 miles every day and not miss a single day of school. So, uh, so, so that's what I kind of, how yeah, did, how did your, yeah. How did your mom instill that sense of, you know, desire and love of education in you and the other kids in the school? Yeah. So I, I think she, like, she grew up at the time where like people would straight up not send girls to school. So like, beyond the legally required like five years. So she had to run away from home and go to a boarding school to become a teacher. 
uh, eventually my grand uh, grandpa accepted that she was going to go to school, but so she had to really fight for it. Uh, and actually she just like, she thought, I mean, before her, there was nobody who had ever gone to college in my like family. Right. So, so but she had personal drive herself. And then I think um, the area also had, was economically very challenged. Like the only income of that region was just apricot farming. Uh, there's no industry. There's really no other jobs you can take. And the money you can make from like agriculture was just going downhill very fast. Uh, so um, it's for for people like there were no other options than just getting educated and taking a like a job as a teacher or a nurse or a doctor. So they were they were really the only options. So I think in between the fact that she had dry plus uh, plus people had no other options. Like if we that region I didn't be so like ridiculous kind of growth and economic status because everybody had to get educated as the only option they had. Gotcha. And yeah. you were like an early adopter of the internet, right? Your parents yeah. kind of brought you the internet yes. early. Yeah. So my, my personal story is like, I, I, I grew up in the village and I, sometimes people like position me as a, like we kind of place me as a uh, millennial, which here is defined as somebody who has grown up with internet. In my case, like I remember mm -hmm. the first time we had t television, like in our region, I remember the first time we had kind of telephones for the first time. I remember the first time we had like clean water in the houses. So I did not grow up with internet necessarily in my kind of early childhood, uh, but um, I was very interested in chess uh, in kind of when I was younger. And then later I was really interested in mathematics, but there was really not much to do with those interests. Um, and my older sister was going to um, college like in a year or so. And like at that time, so as a family, we would actually, my, my parents were teachers, but they had, they had, my father had eight younger siblings. His like parents died very early. So uh, outside the normal jobs, over summers, we would just go work in a farm all together as a family. So we'd just go get built tents, uh, become like temporary, like labor workforce for somebody else who has maybe like like large farms. So that was our summer job. So yeah. um, so we just go there, work there as a family, and that would just bring some incremental additional income to supplement their teacher's uh, salaries. Um, and one of those years, I think, just surprisingly, they made more money than expected. So the, the, the produce from Africa was higher than anticipated. So they had, I would say, disposable income for the first time in their lives. So, um, and we just made the meeting and decided to buy a computer uh, with the like the additional income they had that year. Computers back in Turkey at that time was super expensive. I remember as used, like a four year old used computer, like we, they bought for $800. And um, like the internet was like a couple like hundred dollars per month. Uh, and their salaries as a teacher was maybe two or three hundred dollars. So just a, it was essentially really big spending. Uh, but they bought the computer like mostly for like my small older sister and maybe me. Uh, and I just started finding all those like websites where they were post posting international math Olympiad questions. I found some IRC channels. Like so, I started self teaching myself kind of more competitive level mathematics uh, from online resources. Uh, and that really became my ticket to kind of to do like what I'm doing right now is like I end up winning gold medal in Turkey's national math Olympiads, which was like really surprised because nobody from the kind of southern eastern part of Turkey had really like like been in the national team. Uh, so and then later on I won a silver medal in international math Olympiads. So but all those things were somewhat surprising because like I wasn't in. A, one of the best schools, which was which were which was training everybody for like this more competitive mathematics. But to me, like the key thing here is, no matter how much I work, this would be just not possible pre-internet. So I barely yeah. met internet at the time where at least like I could catch up a little bit, right? I could study myself. I could just find problems to work on, and I could. It, there were even people who were just answering my questions on IRC channels, right? So I think. Internet never will never make the world equal, but like yes, like we are not going to solve all inequalities, but it's definitely an amazing, extraordinary opportunity for people to catch up. Because the moment you, yeah. you see that, and if you did not have opportunities before, you just hold on to that so tightly that 
you're gonna get a lot more value from internet if you're actually in less resource parts of the world. So yeah, that's really kind internet, of how, how, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. It changed that. It seems like it that having access to the internet like really changed your trajectory, and changed your life in, in a pretty it, substantial way. Exactly, I think it changed. Like for me, getting into international met Olympiads is like was big source of confidence. Uh, also just gave me opportunities to like, I mean, to like meet a lot of people and became like a part of my own resume. Uh, and then I um, I actually had the opportunity to come study in maybe United States, but like even with all the grants, it would be fairly expensive. So I kind of didn't want to take the chance that it is going to be very expensive. So I, I still studied in computer science and mathematics in Turkey, but uh, later on, it just allowed me to like meet other very smart folks, and just really was like a big uh, critical milestone for my life. And then, how did you decide you wanted to start a company? So, when I first started college, I wasn't anticipating to be an entrepreneur. I actually like barely had any idea what this tech entrepreneur concept is. Uh, so I was, but. And so I was, I was normally expected to study mathematics and become a math professor. That was the expected route for somebody in the, like, who competed in international math Olympiads. But first year in the college, um, I was spending almost all of my time in the college campus because I did not have a kind of personal computer at that, that year. So I was just using the university labs the computers. So just like, work until morning in university labs and like listen to music there. It was also like essentially we were practicing using those personal computers. Um, and when we had to go for an internship during summer, we wouldn't be able to listen to music because you have to now use company computers. So I had this idea to build a browser-based music player so that yeah. you can listen to music in, anywhere. And that was 2001. So I used Flash 4, uh, if you kind of remember it, so to build <laughs> yeah. a VNAMP clone uh, like in Flash in 2001. And we put some pirated video, like, uh, songs to a computer cloud server. And all of a sudden, we had like playlists and music like playing ability like in any computer we have internet access to. So that was actually like very fun. And honestly, I think that was the moment where I realized I like building things more than the more academic work. So, but I actually still like in 2001 had no idea that these things are startups and they can become big businesses. I thought even like when I first heard about Google, I thought it was somebody's like personal project. I thought I, like, so <laughs> I thought it was somebody's website. It was oh, a nice, like neat website. Didn't realize it was a company. Um, I think in 2005 is when I realized like YouTube and Blogger, like and companies like that were like just like creating platforms for other creators to create interesting things. So I had the idea to uh, build an education platform where anybody could, could teach online. And initially it was a live education uh, kind of focused platform. But the idea to, to take what YouTube and Blogger did and apply it to education was very intriguing in 2000, I would say like six in Turkey. That was the first time I actually, kind of I mean, yeah. It's a little bit informed by your own experience. It seemed like learning so much online. Exactly. I think like the very simple vision I had was that people would just teach, learn everything online in the future. So, and if you just assume learning primarily happens online, then it does make sense to build a platform where there more teachers can teach different skills. And that vision is not the crazy anymore. So if, if somebody told you that they learned how to play harmonica, so your first assumption would be that they learned it online, right? You wouldn't assume they like took a like they bought a book or they went to a class. They would assume they, it was an online learning. So it was as simple as if everybody's gonna learn everything online the way same way I did it, um, we need better platforms to make that kind of to make that work. Uh, that was really, initially I thought the platforms would be live platforms, uh, but so we started a company in Turkey as a live education platform. That didn't work. It was too early. We were working ridiculous hours because we did, we had no funding, right? So we, the way we were funding our small startup is at nights I would start from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. work for a Silicon Valley startup with my co-founder uh, like the whole night, and then we like just sleep in the office for a couple hours, wake up and our team members would come in and then we just would work with them to be at Udemy, uh, so the the original <laughs> Udemy, not the the predecessor of Udemy, not the. Udemy is a legal company, but 
So we had like two full-time jobs, one at night to kind of pay the bills and one during the day, the day to build the company. So definitely really tough times because you're working super hard uh, and also not like, and we launched the product, but it was clear that it was not going to work. So it was a, it was like a, we burnt a lot of like brain cells and energy, just like really got exhausted. But the moment we launched it, we realized like it just, the Turkey did not have the ecosystem that we needed, uh, that the tool was not, the, the live education was not the right idea. It was like wrong time, wrong place, wrong idea. So so we just we had to migrate to United States. Like uh, that was uh, that was in two thousand seven. That's a big move. So how did you how did you decide to go to Silicon Valley? So the uh, as I kind of mentioned, the way I was we were funding the company was we were at nights like working for Silicon Valley companies. Uh, like and, and luckily the Silicon Valley salaries were kind of good enough to fund the entire startup uh, kind of in Turkey. Um, and when we dis- like when we realized like we did not the original processor of Udemy in Turkey was, was not going to become successful. So um, I was, I just, I just essentially migrated to the United States and work full time at the, at the company, which I, I was working at nice for. So what really practically happened is I came to United States, worked during the day for the company. And a couple of years later at nights, I just like took Udemy back on. So, uh, so there was the first take at Udemy, which failed. And we, we, I mean, we failed for a long time. It was like a two, three years of failures, right? So like it was going to be attempted multiple times and just kind of gave up. And in 2010, we decided to give it another shot. So that's when I kind of also met uh, one of my, my our third co-founder, Gagan Biani, was in Silicon Valley. So he and I met with my co-founder, Oktay, and we kind of co- teamed up together again to give it another shot to the same idea, but with a different way. So instead of live education, we... I decided to do more of an on-demand education platform. Um, and also the times had changed. So I think like the, uh, in a way, like the, the time we lost helped because we were way too early in 2007. Uh, but we changed the product, changed the model a little bit, and, uh, and we gave it another shot in 2010. Yeah, I mean, amazing. And this time, like, I guess the time in the market was right. More people were online. Like video yeah. was kind of more, much more established at the time as like an, as a, online medium and, mm-hmm. and so it started working right what, what was the first like how did you know it, it was working in, in this iteration yeah so i think yeah, i i knew it was going to work in t- early 2011 because in 2010 we started the company uh, we really by the way like for a long time failed at raising money so we tried to go raise money got maybe like 30 40 investors to all say this is a stupid idea uh, nobody's going to like spend their own money and own time on learning a skill unless there's a diploma attached to it. That was a very dominant kind of opinion. Even in the smartest investors thought this way. So it's not like, it's something if just some maybe investor that you don't care about says this, but it's something else with the, the legendary investor that you talk to says, nobody is, is going to take spend their own time and money if there's no immediate job opportunities yeah. attached to it. So we... We're just like we we went back, we launched the site without any funding, uh, tried to raise money again, failed again, and I think we actually were about to give up like maybe four times. I think we had given up three times and took the project back on at that point, and we just decided it was not just not going to work. So we said, okay, like Gagan was going to probably look for a new job. We were going to go back to being engineers. Uh, so we're just getting really close to also just permanently giving up. Uh, I think just there was this one day where both Kidrebua, who had met us for the third time at that point, so like he had looked at us twice and he liked what we were doing and the product, but he just still wasn't sure about the business. He just, I think, said, you know what? Like every time you guys come back, you come back with so much more. Like I assume that you will eventually find an idea which which makes sense. So so he. He said yes, like to kind of first investment. And then the same day, I think Ross Raiden independently said, you know what, like, screw it, let's just do it. Let's, like, like I want to be in for your first angel investor. So they both became the first angel investors, like almost like hours apart from each other. Uh, then we were able to raise a full, like $1 million round. And after the round, we were able to work full time on it because my visa relied on uh, my like daytime job. So I, could, I wasn't able to go full time. So that was the time that we were able to go full time. And I would say three, four months after that, we launched our first paid course, which was not even a real course. 
So nobody would teach on Udemy because like we had no students, like why would anybody spend time teaching on Udemy? And also like students wouldn't come to Udemy because there were no, no courses. So we were definitely this like really tough chicken and egg problem phase. So Gagan came up with this brilliant idea, which was uh, we organized a conference called How to Raise Money. And we just gave every instruct every speaker a specific topic to this to talk about. So we sold tickets uh, in a newsletter called Startup Digest that Chris McCann was kind of running, and they promoted the the the, the, the conference. And then we videotaped the conference and converted it into our first actual course. It was like a six lecture yeah. course called Raising Money for Startups, um, and. We put it on the newsletter, and I think we sold 30 copies of it at $30 each. So we made $900 for the, from that first course. And I would say, like, at that moment, I was, sh- like, fairly sure this was going to work because people were spending their own time and own money taking a course, and almost nobody asked for a refund. And we just told people that, like, we were just so shy about this. We said, like, look, if you don't like the course, like, we will give you a refund. Nobody asked for a refund. And a lot of people said this was the best $30 they ever spent because we were like getting really tactical about raising money. So you, you could find a lot of videos or conference about raising money and maybe pitching and things like that. But they were all kind of high level, feel good kind of talks from successful people. So versus what we put up, put up online was very, very tactical. Here is the type of cold email you can send. Here's how you build the pitch deck. Uh, here's like here are the basic legal terms you, for you to learn before you are talking to investors, so that you don't feel like you don't look like you know you know nothing. So we kind of realize this is really extremely tactical aspect of like videos for a concept was actually interesting and wasn't really around like available. So I, I would say like the first course actually selling thirty copies just made me feel like very very confident that there, there was something there. So that was that was that seed, and then how did you, like, I mean, a class of thirty students is not really enough to attract other other instructors, yeah. right? So, like, how did you get the ball rolling on the marketplace and solve that chicken and egg problem? Yeah, so there were a lot of the independent things. I mean, as you are a founder, you'll probably appreciate this type of stuff more because you also done consumer uh, companies, right? So we we had a couple other tactics, but I think what really eventually worked well is. We did these conferences, I think, three times. Each of them became a, became a course. Uh, we sold some. So now the new set of partner we had, which was Startup Digest, was making enough money that they were like, okay, promoting these new courses we, are kind of, we were putting up. Next thing we did is we convinced uh, two instructors who had, uh, one of them had a workshop for, for iOS development, another had a, a Python kind of book coming. So we said, if you produce video course, video content, we'll just go promote your courses like in like everywhere. We'll become your outsource marketing department. So they just produce a course and put it on Udemy. So nobody was coming to Udemy to take courses at that time, but we just went ahead and went to a bunch of newsletters, daily deal sites, whatever channel we can find to promote the course. And we did some rev, rev share with the uh, distribution sites like the newsletters. Um, so even if it was very modest, like the, those courses made a couple thousand dollars. So it was kind of worth the effort they put up. And the nice thing about the, the, the revenue here was it was evergreen. Right? Once you put up the course, you don't have a lot of like incremental uh, kind of resource that you have to invest. So I would say we just kept doing this with like now eventually we had maybe 30 or 40 what we call distribution partners. Amazon local was a big partner. They like daily deal sites were kind of were big. AppSumo, if you might remember, was a big partner for us. Yeah. So we're really selling courses through those third party channels. But then we were just kind of also finding people to teach on, uh, online courses. And one day I think we came to a place where the people who had taken course on Udemy were large enough that if you had another course, just promoting it to existing Udemy users was bringing enough revenue. So that was like a big, like, kind of milestone because now we just didn't rely on third party resources like the actual Udemy students taking new courses that we published was like a, a reasonable distribution channel. So we, we turned from a outsource marketing agency for online courses and a tool to consume those courses to an actual destination where we had users who were like buying new courses. So just really like hitting chicken and it was really all about making sure the instructors were successful 
we get course launches and we do we did like no whatever is needed like to make those courses successful right and eventually that made yeah. it so that existing students eventually accumulated to be large enough to become a distribution uh, by itself that reminds me a lot of twitch actually where you know yeah. we just focused on the you guys focused on the instructors or focused on the streamers and it's like anything and everything possible to make the streamer successful yeah. and feel happy about working with us like we just tried to figure out how to do and yeah. um yeah in the beginning it was a lot of like hand-to-hand -hand combat guerrilla yeah. marketing tactics to like help them get them happy or get them users or whatever yeah no honestly i would say like we, I, we were definitely obsessively looking at justin tv twitch all those other consumer marketplace of companies i mean it's a small world so we're looking at like what everybody else is doing and i think what we had learned like probably you guys learned the same thing is initials was all about doing these unscalable things to make this one person successful, right? Because you make one person successful, you can make the second, third, fourth. Eventually, like, if 30 people are successful, like, that just becomes, like, a trend. Um, and I think the I think interesting thing I didn't have to realize back then is the more distributed, the scalable distribution channels only work when we had scale. When we yeah. did not have scale, the, the things that worked were, like, things which didn't scale, which were, like, us talking to a person about it and just doing conferences or uh, like really kind of just one off ways to make them, make them work. So how, like after you got the ball rolling and, it, and it's working, were there any other difficult moments or kind of critical yeah. inflection points? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I would say once the ball was rolling, we started like growing 20% month on month for maybe the first four years. So it was a really nice like marketplace growth. Um, <laughs> And it, I mean, in retrospective, this sounds, sounds easy, but I would say like the two things which was really hard as one, like we had started the company with so much, like like we put like everything we have into the company and we were barely raised a million dollar at a relatively fairly low valuation. I think it was like $2 million premium valuation. Like like they, those were not the times where you get a $20 million like seed round valuations, right? So like we were just really kind of trying to just like push the ball uphill to make it work. And I think st um, at Stanford, two university professors like started two AI machine learning courses and put them, make them online. And one of those like folks became like Udacity and the other one became uh, Coursera. And like they like completely stole the thunder. just like, like we had started a lot earlier than them, but they just came up and like, I think the first rounds they were getting like, they were raising 10 to $20 million. So they raised, maybe five, 10 times more money than we were able to do after so much like work. But they just like entered with very, very high profiles. There were maybe like five, 10 uh, articles about them in Wall Street Journal and New York Times every week. So like the, it definitely felt like, like we were doing something that just was like the kind of peanuts, a really small business that was not as important. And they really like hit on what really matters, which is like higher, like replacing and disrupting higher education. So, um, like, even though we were just objectively growing month for month nicely, but still the revenues were, like, modest, and what those guys, like, the, the profile they had was just really kind of putting us in the shadow quite a bit. And I would say the, one of the hardest things, things we did was just, like, staying focused and kind of saying, you know what, yes, like, they might be, like, where all the rage is, but what we are doing actually is relevant to more people. So my like explanation yeah. to the team was, look, in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of people who want to learn machine learning from a Stanford professor, right? But if you get out of, like, if you go any direction more than half an hour, the rest of the population <laughs> wants to learn some Excel skills so that they can take their first white color job. They want to learn how to build a website so they can maybe make websites for the kind of low small businesses around them and like get a lifestyle job, right? So like we kind of said like this more practical life like lifelong skills actually are relevant to much more people. And honestly, I wasn't even 100% sure that was the case. So in retrospective, like I can't say I was right, but it, like it wasn't obvious that what we were doing was not stupid. So it, because there was definitely temptation to just pivot to this higher education kind of world uh, which, yeah, so that's really, honestly, like, despite us objective to being fine, like, it was a really tough period in terms of the, like, the the, mind, the investor mindset set completely moving to, like, a different world. Um, and I would say maybe the, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's uh, the second part is was actually about when I had to step down from my kind of CEO job and became a board member instead of you doing. So that was maybe the second kind of major, major challenge. And at, at that point, like we had failed so many times, honestly, they were, like failing it, raising money and everything was almost something we were so used to. So, but emotionally hard times were one, like not being sure whether what we are doing is actually important in the grand scheme of things. And also just like, kind of parting your own company is always difficult. Well, so I'd love to talk about both of those. The, the first yeah. reminds me actually of our own story a lot in that, you know, we felt oftentimes with Justin TV that we were like doing, we were like outshined by other Silicon Valley competitors, you know, like that raised a lot more money or were more high, you know, there's one called Ustream. They raised more money. They were more high profile. They had like Jack Dorsey as an advisor and, you know, they, mm -hmm. So we were often worried about like, what is our competition doing? And mm -hmm. I think whenever we were worried about what their competition was doing and paying too much attention to them, we like didn't build a product that was like very good actually. Mm -hmm. And when we focused on some segment of customers, you know, in this case, gaming companies, mm -hmm. you know, sorry, gaming streamers and like really just dug into what they wanted. And everyone was like, this is stupid. It's not gonna, it's a small market. It's not gonna be a thing, but we just had like a little bit of internal confidence or well it wasn't it's was kind of like you said we like weren't even that confident about it we were just like well this yeah. is what we had like our only shot so like we're going to focus on this that's mm -hmm. that's really what what worked right um yeah and so I, I think that's uh yeah that was that was an interesting contrast right to like watching what other everybody else is doing yeah honestly like people underappreciate how hard it is sometimes to reduce the distraction from like what everybody else is doing because it always feels like in Silicon Valley, there are these other company which, companies which are really crashing it. And what you are doing is just like not worth even working on, right? So like when Udemy was started before even, I would say Coursera and Udacity came out, came and like daily deal sites were doing so well financially. It just felt like everything, every other idea was stupid. So um, yeah. I think some like for example today like people look at you look at the thing like crypto world and like some of the fintech world and like things like this kind of feel so lofty. I mean, look two years ago all the like all the scooters were like all the hype and it felt like they were the only good idea that you can ever imagine. Uh, and right these days like crypto is like getting a lot of like like it, it, it feels like that's where all the interesting things are and everything else like is kind of unimportant. So I think it's it's actually really really hard to. Um, to just almost sometimes get away from the like what is the trendy thing these days on in the world of tech and really instead of focusing yeah. on what is that the customers actually want and need uh that we can be at the deliver on so um, it, it, this is like emotionally especially a lot harder than i think it might sound i, I think you appreciate yeah. it quite even like the like yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember like the Ustream and all the other competitors and there were other types of companies which were going very fast. Uh, but you like acknowledging that like gamers are your customers and they love your platform. And I mean, I was watching people stream Dota like on Twitch back then. Right? So it was, maybe it was not a, like picking something which is not sexy, but actually is very interesting and people enjoy it. So uh, it, it's not easy, especially when there's like really hyped topics in Silicon Valley. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so when you had to step down, why did you end up stepping down from the company or like not being, you know, leaving the CEO yeah. job? Yeah, I, I think there were really two things. So one is I was very focused on product and technology, like engineering in the company, which was like my, where I, which was my comfort zone and maybe growth was the other thing. Uh, but I actually was talking to another kind of podcast with Darian this morning, like, I just didn't feel like I was doing the like A plus CEO job. Like I, I, I felt like eventually I was too focused on product and tech and in a way that um, where the company success wasn't just reliant on product, it was also reliant on marketing and customer acquisition and content and like managing investors, customer support. So I was like a too narrowly focusing and I had delegated too much. Uh, and actually one of the maybe new content I can give you that I had mentioned is like, there was one of the executives who I really trusted in the company. I asked him, I said, like, do you think the company would benefit from another CEO? Like, who's just going to, like, care more broadly about the company's priorities, right? 
And I thought he was just going to say, no, like, I think you're doing an extraordinary job. And he, he said, like, <laughs> he, he says, he said, like, look, we have been growing very fast. And I think you're, you're like, very talented, like, about product and everything. But he said, like, I could see, like, uh, somebody who is experienced in these XYZ fields would be actually useful for the company. So I, I, this is something I had never mentioned before, like, in any other kind of interview. But to me, like, like, he, like he was, like, he, I trusted him. He liked me quite a bit. And. The fact that he thought maybe maybe we like we could actually benefit from it, another CEO like that actually I took it very serious. I said you know that that means like maybe I like that kind of confirmed my my almost fears that I wasn't being the best you I could be. Right. Yeah. So and I, I had that 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 feeling, and then I think simultaneously like I think the. I was also kind of really intimidated with like honestly interacting with investors. I'll, I'll be like again this is another thing I'm going to be admitting today. So. Look, you're an immigrant, you have a heavy accent, you sometimes miss the anecdotes, like miss the kind of football game they are talking about. Like you, there's definitely this like outsider feeling where like you don't feel like you're belonging there, right? And it's, it's yeah. interesting, some of these investors are like, it's not, they were not doing anything wrong or bad. Like they were just like, I mean, I now I've known them for like 15 years, like they're very friendly people, but like I was intimidated with like this whole investor board like interaction concept. I was just like, kind of not like feel like feeling as comfortable and because i was feeling a little somewhat intimidated from this like this world this business the finance world which i didn't fully like i didn't even know the terminology that well right so and again like the language also puts a, definitely puts a kind of reduces your self-confidence time to time so um so like between those i think like the like i was getting because i was nervous around the whole investor board like world i was somewhat delegating that too much as in like I was trying to have somebody else like some our chief operating officer around the like board meetings and everything so eventually I think the, the board like decided that it was going to be better for me to become more the really focused on the product side because I think their perspective was I was really focused on just product anyway so they thought it might be better for me to be, become the chief product officer and then maybe we um, even either hire a third party CEO or maybe bring our, our CEO chief operating officer to be the CEO so they just made the, I'd say, pretty reasonable judgment call that that might be better. So, but despite that was the case, and honestly, I knew it was a reasonable call to make because I fired people before, like so, and they were not even firing me; they were just asking me to become chief product officer, which they thought was more in line with what I was kind of wanted trying to wanting to do. So, but I still, for some reason, I just hearing the words like really made me emotional, regardless. So. Um, there's this thing where like, sometimes you know like you could do things better, but see like somebody somebody else acknowledging it also kind of is different. So despite the, the 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 fact that I thought maybe like the company could benefit from like in a little better CEO, like I, I I still didn't like take that feedback too well in the first like couple months. But then I think I just yeah. I, I got over it and I just like maybe still, like three, four months I got over it and then I became actually even more involved with the board. I became even closer with the board members and investors. And I thought it was maybe an opportunity for me to like start again. And this time became, became like an, like a better CEO, like the kind of A plus CEO, like more balanced uh, person. So you know, it, it became an opportunity for me to just try it again a second time. But initially it was not like the, the, the action of leaving the company that you put almost all your 20, like 20s was, was not easy. Yeah. And okay. So, so how long did you last at the company after you kind of gave up the CEO role? So I was there for another maybe six months or so, just kind of help with transition and everything. But I made it very clear that I was, I didn't want to like a double headed company model. So uh, I was relatively uh, like, I was mostly like a resource for people to come to and debate ideas rather than being active. But also I think I, I would say like, I was somewhat still like, I was somewhat emotional for like for maybe six months or so. Um, and uh, I didn't really take a long break. I just jumped into carbon pretty much immediately after that. But um, it was it was a nice time to also kind of like to s- slow down a little bit, like go to a couple of vacations um, and really just kind of understand what is it that I want to do in my life with my life. And so how did you tell me how you like came up with the idea for carbon and what how did you you talked a little bit about like things you wanted to do differently the second time. Yeah. Like, tell me about that. Sure. 
I want to just start with the, the order. The order is like, I first started with how I want to do things differently. So um, I wrote four lines in my Evernote back in that day. So um, I, I, I titled values. And again, at that moment, I don't know what even field I'm going to work on. Like, I don't even know whether, whether I'm going to be doing healthcare or finance or I don't know. I had a lot of crazy ideas. I put up four videos. The number one was assume karma exists. So because I had this heuristic that to be to start the most successful companies, you have to sometimes give up on trying to calculate every move. So I thought the, the way to start like a ridiculously successful company is sometimes just doing what you think is right consistently. And then just like believing that eventually if you do, do, do the right thing consistently, it will come back to you as a business. Like I thought there was actually real karma in business. P- people observe what you're doing, appreciate your like more genuine effort. So assume karma exists was like really kind of central value I wanted to have in the new company. And I had some others like respecting the craft, really kind of appreciating that, like hiring people who genuinely care. Like, so, but I, but I wanted to do something where we could win by doing what we think is the right thing, like like in a long uh, okay, um, for a long time. So, and in my mind, like healthcare was always one of those things where, just like education, is type of thing that everybody needs, um, and it is where like the the access to healthcare is extremely unevenly distributed, um, and I thought if I bring together a really dedicated group of people from technology, like physicians, product, they could actually provide a healthcare experience, which is significantly better than what we have today. And I also believe that they could do this without increasing the cost. Essentially, I thought, let's just assume whatever healthcare costs for an average American today, let's assume that's the cost and you cannot increase it, right? But you want to provide by far the best healthcare experience you, 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 that can be provided. So I had that like that kind of idea was kind of vague in the beginning, and then like it, in iterations it became more obvious. Initially, I was thinking of trying to do this as a marketplace type of business, trying to steal from the Udemy playbook. Uh, so and and I realized that, like marketplace, the whole like marketplace fundamental that didn't really match with the, what we needed there in that specific domain. Then we decided to become like a software company and really build a software and partner with existing practices. So that did that worked a little bit, but wasn't as good as we thought. But eventually, maybe after two, three years of iterations, uh, we came up with this idea to be to really own every single aspect of patient experience and provider experience, and which meant we we really became extremely vertically integrated. So we built the entire software platform from the ground up. We own all the clinics, we design them, we employ all the clinicians, we are really big on the company culture and the, the values in the company. So essentially owning software, hardware, operations, um, like together was eventually became the idea. And I didn't come to it in, like, even though actually like in retrospect, uh, that's what I kind of wanted to do emotionally, but it felt like a very high like very tough thing to do if you have no idea and health, no experience in healthcare. So I had to just like slowly convince me myself that it was the right idea. So that's why we went through all those iterations. But I think like we kind of, we came back to what I, like I had drafted and I, the idea was originally called like, what would world's largest hospital look like? That was really kind of one liner kind yeah. of idea with that with a lot of like fill in the blanks thinking. So, and yeah, so we, again, iterations and actual business model and operations and everything, but it was, it was really kind of the simple, like idea of like, can you make it so that there is a healthcare experience, which is extremely differentiated, very modern that an average retail employee, average teacher um, can afford uh, to access in the United States. Gotcha. And so that like, that that's that was a that was that was your path through multiple iterations and then eventually mm-hmm. you created this as like a new provider basically like that that was yeah exactly I think you, after like, we're the primary care provider exactly eventually we became a primary care provider so we now have primary care urgent care virtual care services we are adding now mental health uh, we are doing more and more in women's health 
but really I think the, uh, the, the services are really just like the frontline healthcare services, the, the type of services that you would just go to first before you go to a hospital. Uh, but the real, and the model is make everything as affordable as humanly possible, which means we cannot charge a subscription fee and the um, reimbursement rates we take from insurance companies, which is are very reasonable. And the reason it's important is because these days, majority of the population have high deductible insurance plans. So if you actually have high reimbursement rates, like some of the maybe hospitals or some more kind of a premium kind of segment providers, at this point, like it will be most of the cost is reflected directly to the to the individual patient, right? So because now yeah. these days, like deductibles are are the first line of payment. So the, being affordable is very critical. So we just really said like this is the cost. We are not going to increase that cost. But what is the best healthcare you can provide? I think that that perspective got us into vertical integration because we realized the only way to create this level, the, 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 the level of patient experience we wanted with the cost structure we wanted to charge, the only way to make it possible was us really owning everything extremely tightly. Yeah, that's a super difficult startup or like company to start, right? With like, I mean, there's an, I try to make a vertically integrated, you know, kind of uh, services company and, you know, you had companies like Katera. There's like a long list of dead bodies, and, and, and yeah. people have tried to try to like. How do you think you've done things well, or like stayed focused? You know, during yeah, uh, so with such a white, large white space area. Yeah, to be honest, like this was a similar. I mean, this was an order of magnitude harder than Udemy. I would say, like that's that is definitely true. So because you have this super complex service industry called healthcare, like far more complicated than transportation or food delivery or like really honestly any other service industry you can imagine. But, and even from day one, you need to be able to, like if you to be a healthcare provider, you need a physical location, you need to be able to prescribe medicine, you need to be able to do labs and medical images, referrals, insurance reimbursement is very complicated. So there's like all this malpractice and all this clinician management. So the regulatory stuff, so it's, it is the type of the business which has a lot of upfront work you have to do well before you are seeing any success. So in our case, I would say like, despite coming out of Udemy's success, the first three years of the three, four years of the company was really brutal. I mean, now I can say this because we raised a half a billion dollars and we are doing really well, but we actually completely ran out of money twice. We like I saw zero in the bank account twice because like I raised, we raised the seed run easily. Seed run is mostly people who have made money from Udemy. They would just they would obviously would like fund the next company I started. One of those board members at Udemy just like became like Series A investor, became a board member. Um, series Seed and A was kind of easy from just like track record. But everybody hated this idea of us owning physical locations. And they hated it so passionately. I just like, a lot of investors I talked to, they like would say, Aaron, like when you were coming to pitch us here, we were actually ready to give you a term sheet, right? Because they like <laughs> you started a very successful multi-billion dollar company. You're just like off, off of course you're gonna fund your next company. But owning this clinic is such a bad idea. Like we just cannot do it. It's just like it is they they did they were so passionate about hating the physical location. Like the, the fact that we have physical locations, they hate that. The fact that it was fee for service, like actually going through insurance, they hate that. The fact that it was primary care, which is considered considered a zero margin business, they hate that. So um, it's really like almost everything people hate about healthcare investment just like coming together. And I I embrace that, but the reality is all the combination of all these things like primary care, physical locations, paid by insurance. And not premium, just like mass market. These four things, the community, the intersection of these four things is still 90% of all healthcare. Like everything else is peanuts, yeah. really small markets here and there. So convincing investors was, was really, really hard. Like I think the the four rounds you raised, A, B, C, like we only had one term sheet in each round. And this is the part I think you can, you, talk, you like talking about the emotional part of it. I actually felt a lot more stress because when you're a first time entrepreneur, your default assumption is that you're gonna fail, right? So you're not like, like you don't take it very emotional when people do not invest in you, right? 
So, yeah. but being a person who started a successful company, coming back to vessels and just getting nose one after each other, like, and really like in every step, like having just one, on like one investor like remaining. And lucky we always like amazing one investor. So like it actually worked out pretty like pretty well. And also like the other thing that worked out well is like we got this one investors who truly believed in the company as it is. Like they actually did not want to change the company. They just like they they were like big believers and they were actually like it was a good idea to like get money from people who believed in it. But it was actually emotionally really hard to just like getting rejected despite having all the track records. So. Um, uh, I would say like it was and interesting a lot of the company also that they they, they just they kind of believed that I was gonna figure it out somehow, so it was like, like almost like asymmetric amount of like emotional load on myself um, because yeah. I didn't feel like the kind of failing was like like anyway it was I I would take it a lot more hard like I was taking it a lot like harder in a second time. That's uh that's interesting. I feel like um. Yeah, I can see how it would be a lot more personal. It's like you're you have this track record, you should be able to raise money easily, and then like having to struggle with it is you know like can be that can be tough. You feel like rejection. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I think it's just so, like the. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Yeah, I was saying like this is like again. I think the the, the I think a lot of people don't do that recognize like when you have one company which is successful, the second company is actually like are are more stressed. So actually I have other friends who are like, who attempted second companies. And I would say like, they were, they look a lot more like burnt out and stressed at the same time. I think that's probably how I looked. Well, I don't know. I was very stressed the first time too. So <laughs> I don't know if it was any better, but, uh, or any worse, but it wasn't any better. I don't think. Um, yeah. so, so tell me about you guys' COVID response. Cause kind of from the outside, it mm -hmm. looked like things may have really accelerated for carbon health while you you know like during covid and and i know you guys had a big role in like testing yeah uh, and vaccinations for the for the state of california yep i think this covid journey has been super interesting because it wasn't obvious that it would help our growth because 2019 19 we had finally made the core fundamentals work in the business and we took, I think, uh, Brookfield became a big investor. And we finally, like, it felt like things were working. I think, like, 2015 to 19, it was like, really, like, uphill, kind of, like, struggling. And 19, like, the unit economics started working. Clinics were profitable. And we had some people who believed in the model as it is. And in, we came to 2020 and just finally ready to just scale the company at maybe 20, 25 clinics. And just it was going to be our first, like, high growth year after like long kind of periods of like optimizing unit economics, technology, because one thing that I did different that kind of un, very unusual at Carbon Health is we did not scale the company until we hit all the key unit economics and software and provider experience, like goals we wanted. Like we, we intentionally kept it slow until we, we felt like it was ready to scale. So, and January came and we were watching the COVID developments in Wuhan, China, and actually, some of our team members were very kind of nervous about this. So we put this pre-appointment scheduling. We have a pre-appointment scheduling questionnaire type of system, which asks questions that the doctor would be asking. So we had two questions to that system about whether people had traveled to Wuhan before. We launched that. Two days later, I got a call from my chief operating officer saying two people from, had come from Wuhan, China to California and came to our clinics with respiratory symptoms. So it just became clear to us that the thing that like, at that point, like in January, like people assumed this was a China problem. So yeah. just like a couple months, like, but we just identified, there's no way this is not, this is actual content. This is like, this has gotta be in the community like already. I think a lot of people don't realize how big Wuhan, China is. Like Wuhan is a pretty big state, right? So um, a lot of people like travel for, from there to United States fairly regularly. So, so we made this meeting to discuss what is it that we would want to do if we think COVID has become if COVID becomes a huge pandemic. And at that time, honestly, like I didn't, I wasn't sure we were, we were going to be able to survive because our clinics are right in the front lines of this, 
and we did not know the actual clinical impact of COVID. And at that time, around, especially in February, in 10% of the people who died in Italy were healthcare workers, right? So um, I certainly did not want my like employees to like have a lot of casualties, right? So it was like, it was the situation where at one point, like one part of me was saying, we just should just like shut down clinics, call it off. You just cannot be in the front lines of it. So, um, and we should just really kind of protect like our, our own workforce, like from COVID as like the number one priority. But our clinical teams like came and said, they just want to lean, lean into the pandemic. It was not like me. Honestly, a lot of people kind of give me credit for being in the front lines of the pandemic very early on. The reality is like, I was prepared to just say, let's just like protect you guys. And like, it is what it is. Like we might be likely kind of not survive, right? So, but they said, you know, like this is a pandemic and we are healthcare workers. This is like our job. Like we have to be like, we just cannot lean back at the time where the, 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 the country needs us the most. So they just made the judgment call to lean into the pandemic. I, I like, I, I wasn't like, again, like prepared to just ask them to do it. Um, and we just said, you know, okay, if they are leaning in, the entire company is going to focus on responding to this pandemic. And we assumed we were not going to make it because when the pandemic first broke around maybe March in the United States, we lost 80% of our patient volume overnight. Overnight, like such old clinics, yeah. we're now like losing a ton of money. People didn't want to come go outside. Uh, virtual care was growing, but it wasn't enough to kind of cut down the, co- the costs in the, in the clinic side. So we, we, we made this meeting and I drafted 12 really, really crazy out there ideas. Yes, we said like, these are the craziest ideas I can think of for us to respond to the pandemic. And over the last next 15 months, I think we actually implemented almost every single idea there in that original list. I had this idea to have like trailers going from town to town and offering testing solutions. And the idea was like, in the future, they would actually also help with vaccinations when vaccines are kind of ready. We did that, we we launched the first mobile trailers. We went to towns where we were seeing 25% positivity rate in the, in like in like mid last year. Just these were like all those meat manufacturing and agricultural town, towns in the middle of California. So they really appreciated us like being there right there for them. We launched the first at home testing kits. We launched the largest data set for all the like clinical data sets which researchers could use. Uh, we launched. Um, a database of all testing locations that actually a lot of other kind of resources used. So there were, there were really like a 12 different initiatives we deployed and we launched them at a really kind of like not seen before type of pace. I mean, people were yeah. so surprised to see like how fast we were just like deploying sizable projects when companies like CVS and Walgreens, which were in the, the government committed to like respond to the pandemic. They were like so slow with their efforts versus we were just launching things, getting scale. Uh, so, and actually, I think that what really made Carbon Health the Carbon Health we kind of people like today is we showed the value of a small but extremely driven and competent healthcare provider. So, because we were good at the operations, yeah. we, we had the technology. And people were realizing like that meant like we could launch a service very quickly and at a really high quality kind of service level. Whether this was COVID related to care or something else, like I think a lot of the people who just became super fans of carbon, they just acknowledged that replace COVID with any other form of healthcare, we want the same thing. We want somebody to be able to be to dynamic and respond to the changing needs of the customers, use technology, use operations. So all these kind of things actually develop on top of each other. And maybe one of the kind of probably big turning points for us was in January 2021, this time the, now the vaccines were around for three months, but the vaccine rollout, you might remember, was going horrible. Like we were like yeah. the government run operations were barely consuming like a third of the kind of vaccine supplies they had because they had completely underestimated how hard the last mile would be for vaccine distribution. And I, I look, I remember this very pretty clearly because the oversimplification was CVS and Walgreens have thousands of locations around the country. So we'll just give the vaccines to them and they're going to administer the vaccines to the entire population. So the moment I can realize this was a plan, I was like, I was pretty sure that was going to fail. 
The reason is it takes two, three minutes to administer a vaccine, but you have to monitor them for 30 minutes if they are high risk or at least 15 minutes. So the, the bottleneck for vaccine distribution, I can acknowledge, was going to be the physical space to monitor them. So existing clinics or like pharmacies were not the right fit for large scale vaccine administration. So I said like we, we should just go grand stadiums and go build those real large physical like areas where we can like administer vaccines to four or five hundred people, at least a couple thousand people per day, so that we can more efficiently monitor them rather than putting them into like one room. So that, I had this kind of thought. So and we prepared a little bit. We just made a quick demo for a vaccine distribution tool that we would actually do if it was we were asked them. At that point, like nobody had asked us to. There were vaccines that yeah. the government was had monopoly on vaccines, but we just kind of sketched out the model saying this is how it should be working. And Los Angeles was doing particularly poorly. I think it was like the one of the, the worst cities in terms of the, the population of vac- the, 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 the city that was vaccinated. And the, the state system had kind of was crashing all the time, was very kind of unusable. Like it was designed for desktops, but people were mostly admitting vaccines in mass vaccination sites and like they needed the iPad as the kind of primary risk. So there were a lot of reasons, but like it was not working well. So we showed what we had designed to city of Los Angeles, the mayor's office and the, and the LA um, fire department and like a nonprofit, like which was helping them. And they just like said, and also to their credit, like they said, how fast can we deploy this? We are just going to report the entire state yeah. system. So, and 36 hours from that initial discussion, we just launched our vaccine scheduling portal and the, all the traffic came to our side. And then that we were like scheduling 20,000 appointments like per, like per hour. So it was, they just, shifted everything to our website to schedule and then i think maybe seven days after that that conversation we launched dodger stadium with the help of la fire department and core kind of core response nonprofit and the kind of mayor's office so we just like we were now like running the large helping run the largest mass vaccination site in, site in the country in dodger stadium so it was really like i guess like a nine ten days of like going from zero to a like viable product. It wasn't going from zero. We were like using our existing kind of systems like infrastructure that we had built for our normal clinics, but we just changed them enough to be like viable for a mass vaccination site. Um, so went live in nine days and like iterated like crazy. Like it was such a, like such an intense time where like I and all of our exact team and a lot of our teams, we, we just went to LA. Most of the team was working from the Dodger stadium uh, and I, I, I like it's unbelievable that we made that work in such a short amount of time. It was just showing like the kind of video of dedication and really kind of we just thought that like there was no other alternative. We just had to make it work. Yeah, that's incredible. And you did it all. I mean, was this there was no like contract or anything where right? you just did it like as yeah. a public service? Yeah, I think we did it. And like the 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 city of Los Angeles told us that yes, like they were gonna support that. But I think signing a contract was maybe like a couple more months after that. So it has been positive for us in the sense that we have done really high scale vaccination, COVID testing, a travel clearance is another kind of area. And I think as the therapeutics are coming into play, we are just deploying this very fast. So I would say it really helped us first, like get a lot of patients to experience carbon for the first time. And once they come to our clinics and even get a basic COVID test, like their reaction is like, why is rest of my healthcare not the same? Right? So why can't I do this for like everything else I'm doing? So, and a lot of these patients just become carbon health patients. So it has been a great customer acquisition tool. Uh, like it, so it just really allowed people to see us for the first time. It also helped us really kind of build the brand around uh, just making an impact when the, when we had the opportunity to do so. So between the branding and customer acquisition, it has really kind of helped accelerate our growth. So we have grown, I think we were the second fastest growing private company based on Inc. Mega, Inc. 5000 list. So and some of it was not COVID. Like we were just opening clinics. So like there were, those clinics were in construction already for like a long time before COVID started. But 
I would say it really helped us because when we were growing very aggressive with opening more locations, COVID allowed us to kind of fill those locations with patients so we did not lose a ton of money. So it just made the, the cost of expanding a lot less burdensome on the company. Oh. Wow. Um, that's an incredible journey. So any, as you've kind of like, now that you've been operating your second company for, I guess, like six years, right? Like how yep. have you, like, are there any, are there any lessons from your second company that you wish or like that, you know, now that you wish you, you had known kind of when you started? Yep. I would say the, the most important one is that there are a lot of different ways to be successful. I think what really matters is whether the style that you are running the company matches your personality. Right? Look, I think if you're a cutthroat, hyper-competitive person, you just need to set company around that style if you're a different yeah. way you want to do things. So, um, for example, I had realized what I enjoy doing is just really be like intuition oriented. Like I like hiring smart people and trusting them. Uh, and I do not, for example, enjoy being data driven. I, like I look at data, I'm, I'm a mathematician. I just understand how to look at the data. So, but I always assume data is incomplete. So I like my personal style is really just like hiring people, trusting them, uh, betting on them, like investing on them. And then can really trust your judgment, judgment like quite a bit. I assume uh, I, I believe that intuition is like very critical. And then I just go design a company around that. And I think this model is not going to work for everybody because like I genuinely like have that feeling. I genuinely trust people's instincts. But there are other people who like being extremely data driven, who want to like measure everything and run the entire company with numbers. I think it's, it's test the reality. Like you have to start a company around that 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 style. So I think like the, the founder style has to really match how we structure the company, the products. Uh, honestly, even what you do have to somewhat match like your intent. Like there's no way I could start an advertise ad tech company. Like advertising is numbers driven business, just doesn't work well with me. Even though I understand numbers, I don't like living by numbers. Right. But healthcare, yeah. like what I like about healthcare is at the end of the day, like you do the right thing. Uh, people observe what you are doing and they understand that you have good, genuine intentions and they, they actually reward you for that. Like the, there were all these moments where we got so much value from COVID-related work we did, which we had, which we'd never calculated. Like as an example, like Google shut down our application on Android store, which was like a huge problem. We have a very big Android kind of customer base. And be, they just were not really were very unresponsive to our kind of our desires to kind of like to review like the cases because they were like saying that you are doing something out of COVID nineteen and at that point they were saying only like CDC and like some like non like some healthcare organizations can have any content around COVID nineteen. So and so, like what really like the way we were kind of enabled again is a former Google executive like who was following what we were doing on Twitter well, was a super fan. Like he wrote a letter to the, the executive, executive in charge of Android and like very quickly got us reopened, right? So like, this is not yeah. something we always think about, but like sometimes when you do the right thing and then people actually like, observe it, like you, they just really want to help your company. They want, like, I think we are this company, like people wanted us to be some, be successful because they can appreciate it how we were tackling uh, COVID response. So, and that actually just like really a series of events that I had never thought about happened, which made the company far more successful than like it would normally be without COVID. Right? I would say essentially to turn into like really big difficult times to just really shining when the, the when our country needs us, and that that really kind of unlocked a big thing. So it's really I, I would say like this is not for everybody. You just need a lot of like belief. Like you almost need to religiously believe that. Like if you do the right thing, it is gonna work out eventually. So that, that is not for everybody. I think it's like really obviously like my number one is like your style has to match your company. If you're extremely customer experience focused, your business has to be type of business which which succeeds with customer experience. I think like if there's a mismatch between your style and the company, that doesn't work. 
I'll, I'll tell you, like when we were doing software, like we were trying to more like do more like a SaaS type of platform. Part of the reason it didn't work was I am not a SaaS entrepreneur. I'm just never gonna be yeah. good at selling enterprise software. So I am a consumer person. I just really I care about patient experience more than everything else. Customer experience that doesn't perfectly work that well with if your main customer is the company, not necessarily the customer. I love that message. You got to do do what what matches your own personal style. Yeah, amazing. I I, I think that's the most like that's very un, unintuitive because everybody thinks that they can do to start any company. But look, there's a reason Steve Jobs was successful at Apple and then like Pixar. Like, look at the companies who's involved. Like, there's a theme there. Like, those are the type of companies where the obsession towards the product and customer experience and like being kind of really innovative, like such not like being extremely obsessed to uh, obsessed with details, it really worked well. Like if Steve Jobs started a like ERP company, I I would bet put put my money that he would be just like 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 <laughs> like he would be extremely successful. Yeah, uh, that's a great place to end it. I've I've taken up a lot of your time. Really thankful that you were able to come on the on the podcast and share your story. Thanks for thanks for doing it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Justin. I get. I've been following what you are doing for a long time. So it was kind of finally, uh, it was fun to kind of catch up with the, with the podcast as the excuse.